Good morning and good afternoon, and welcome to SmartLogic's webinar, Semantic AI, Making Great Data and Making Data Great. My name's Anne, and I'll be your host today, and I have two great speakers. First, Jeremy Bentley, our CEO and founder here at SmartLogic, and Scott Henninger, who, while new to SmartLogic, is not new to semantics. And Scott is a senior solution architect here at SmartLogic. A couple things before we start get started. This webinar is in broadcast mode, so you're all muted. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the GoToWebinar question panel, and we'll get to as many of them during the Q&A session as we can. And finally, the broadcast is being recorded, and replay information will be sent to everyone who's registered within one day following the broadcast. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, so let's have a quick squiz at the agenda. Um, it is Smart Logic giving the webinar, so there's a little bit about Smart Logic, but most of the time is uh, this is an educational series of uh, webinars. This is the first in the series, um, and actually, if anyone on the audience has an idea for a, what you'd like to see more in depth or a different kind of uh, subject that you get uh, curious about as we go through this webinar, please just put it in the note uh, chat box at the bottom, and we'll see what we can do um, to sort that out. Um, then we're going to talk about semantic AI, the what and where it fits, um, and then look at the business value of semantic AI, and then uh, that should take me about 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, and then I'll hand over to Scott, who will take you through the semantic tools and technologies uh, that are used to, 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 to build, to actually deliver those benefits. Um, we will try and use... Uh, the word semantic AI as opposed to the word semaphore, but sometimes it slips in because uh, that's us and that's our product. But we'll try hard not to be too overt because uh, semantic AI is very exciting for anyone who's in the field uh, and it does deliver significant business value uh, to all of our customers uh, who employ it. Thank you. Then we'll finish with some QA. Uh, and if you wanted to put questions in the in the uh, question panel in the in the chat, then we'll moderate those and get those out. And if we don't have enough time, we will uh, send out answers later. So that's the subject of today's webinar, semantics and semantic AI. And I just want to start um, with the title, make great data and make data great. Um, one infers the creation, the synthesis of data, that's make great data. And the other is about making high quality, existing data of high quality, making it great. And the reason why we need to do that, both the synthesis and the quality, is because business need to use their information assets, turn it into knowledge in order to do useful business things like prevent revenue leakage, minimize risk, accelerate growth, all of which lead to competitive advantage either because it's, you know, it's, it's less costly or it's more profitable, etc. And so when you're looking at uh, the semantic AI technology, um, we, amongst our customers, we're applied in enterprise initiatives such as improving customer experience, getting to customer intimacy, being able to cross-sell and upsell their partner, uh, and more product, be able to you know, work through contracts so we don't miss uh, contract points that may lose us money if we don't take advantage of it, for in, say, the area of uh, uh, supplier management. We know that records management and records retention is very important, but they typically quite often get lost, and so we get called in to make sure that records have, uh, are, are more uh, carefully tagged with a higher quality so that they can be found. And the fundamental, I suppose, is that there are three parts to our Semaphore Semantic AI platform, really in that, firstly, it harmonizes data, it extracts data, and it enriches other data and other data systems. And if you look at the side that's extracting and harmonizing text and turning that extracted, harmonized text into qualified contextual data, that's how we make great data. And if you take the actions of harmonizing and enriching existing data and turning that data into qualified contextual data, that's how we make data great. The 
focus of our customer base is large multinational transglobal 2000 organizations and they are all use the same software but their focus their focus is their information intensive uh, operations and they use their information in this information age uh, to gain themselves some competitive advantage and then they use us and they use semantic AI to do that faster and more cheaply and better than the old way of working. So what sort of problems do uh, can we solve with semantic AI? And these are the sorts of questions when I'm meeting our customers. You know, when we're first meeting, there's an idea that semantics may help a particular business problem. There's an endless amount of business questions. Here is a nine. I will pick out three. Um, you know, I quite often will sit there with someone who's, you know, in charge of the customer intimacy in an organization. They'll say, look, there's great value in my customer interactions, but I can't access the data because it's in text form. I've got all these uh, phone logs and um, interaction, you know, text interactions of what's going on in my help center, but I can't, I can't, I need that data that will help me get to understand my customer, the customer better and service them better. How do I do that? Um, we often get called in when there are different systems, maybe through a merger and acquisition. Some company A has bought company B, and now we've got to merge the systems together, but actually company A has a completely different set of vocabularies to the to company B, and now they've got you know 90 days to bang their heads together and then go off and behave as one company, but they've got different vocabularies, and they need an enterprise catalog uh, that helps unify the language of this new business uh, equally it can be new products or it can be the acquisition or it's the launch of new stuff so it's not just mergers and acquisitions it's anything where there are different vocabularies um, we know that a uh, very sensitive and important subject is personal and sensitive information um, but actually where is that uh, sensitive information. It's very easy, usually easy to find it in your databases, but what about in the emails? What about in the, uh, you know, the customer reports? In fact, you know, it's a very important because it's very sensitive from a compliance perspective uh, and it's very uh, sensitive on a reputation perspective, but actually getting to grips with personal and sensitive information and where it is and how we can uh, control it and lock it down and delete it, which is part of GDPR right of, of, of a person. Um, you need semantics for that. So that's three out of nine. Uh, I can go on for days on the different use cases, um, but I don't have the time, so I apologize. I think we all understand diagrams like this. This is a traditional enterprise architecture. Um, multiple databases, multiple business systems, we'll call that the structured world if you like. Uh, then multiple content management systems, information feeds coming in, records management, digital asset management, lots of search engines, and let's loosely call that the information services layer. And then connected, not quite as nicely as this PowerPoint because these are straight lines, uh, but are the system applications which support the business users and the actual, the whole stakeholder of an organization, the audience from the people who are creating uh, content all the way to customers who may need to consume it, decision makers needing their business intelligence. And so you've again got this multiple heterogeneous environment, lots of connections between business intelligence systems and the different systems, you know, and let's call that layer the system application layer. And I think with this traditional information technology, it's the meanings and the relationships. If you, if you are technical, you'll know that the meanings and relationships are predefined and hardwired into these data formats and the application code at design time. And that means that when something changes, humans must get involved. And offline, because some of the business wants some new change or a new product or a new idea or a new topic or a new concept or a new relationship, that means that when that change happens, and that happens all the time in business, humans must get involved. And offline, the parties must define and communicate, and they sit down and have lots of design meetings uh, to get the knowledge needed to make the change. And then they have to go and recode the data structures and the program logic to accommodate the change, and then apply these changes to the databases and the applications. And then, and only then, can they implement the changes. 
and this takes a lot of money and a lot of time, but it is what we're used to. It's our traditional way of working. The semantic AI is taking away, or if you like, in, in not taking away, it's taking away the complication, but it's by adding in a abstract that sits between the information services and the systems applications. Because semantic AI technology encodes meanings, complex concepts and relationships, and the relationships between those concepts separately from the data and content and separately from the application code. And if you like, that layer, the light blue layer, is where the semantic AI layer sits in between information services and system applications so that all the systems and all the data can access and address the enterprise meaning concepts and relationships otherwise known as context. So that's the real business, the sort of technical advantage because now we don't have, whenever there's a change, we don't have to sit down and have these endless discussions about what that means in all the different systems and all the different databases because there's one place to go for the addressable enterprise context. Second thing is that because knowledge is captured in knowledge models or meaning is captured in knowledge models, from a user perspective, user experience perspective, we can actually show those uh, knowledge models to the audience, which gets the human user a better understanding of the subject because we are delivering context of the subject that they're interested in at that point in time. And we'll go and look at that in more detail. The only thing I would say, as a, as a thing, our customers, this isn't, wasn't our project name for it, but our customers are calling semantic, semaphore semantic projects as 1010 projects. What they, they call them 1010 projects because compared to the old way of working, the semantic project is delivering their projects in 10% of the time and 10% of the costs than the old way. And that's very exciting. So we're also using AI. Uh, it's a lengthy discussion. Um, there are lots of debates. It clearly is the Industrial Revolution uh, you know, 2.0. Um, there's uh, philosophical uh, conversations whether we you know is everyone aiming for what they refer to as AI singularity which is the ability for a machine to behave better faster more intelligently than a human um, and in smart logics domain we don't think that singularity is going to be here for some considerable time and actually would prefer the A and AI not to be artificial intelligence but actually stand for either assisted or uh, augmented intelligence because it is an interplay between humans and machines and then very specifically in the spectrum of AI I can't talk to you about robotics or speech-to-text or image recognition because that's not what uh, our company's uh, got a reputation for but we, our reputation is in the uh, machine learning natural language processing classification content extraction uh, area and that I feel very confident about. So when we're just grounding our conversations, that's what I'm drawing the experience of our customers and our customers' business value from. So we've talked a little bit about how the semantic AI fits in the enterprise, but actually what are the component parts? What is the AI technology that's being used in combination with semantics, which Scott will talk to you a little bit more about the standards and the uh, the important um, emergence of now known global adopted standards in semantics, coupled with some really exciting uh, uh, computer science in the form of AI. And so sitting in that semantic AI stack, as a minimum, these are the things you should be looking for. Um, Fact extraction. Can you turn text-based assets into data by extracting the data? We'll have some examples of that for you. Can the stack really understand NLP, natural language processing? Can it do it in multiple languages? The languages of the world, we're including all the character-based languages such as Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, if you have that requirement, and of course, multinationals always you know, typically have many language requirements. But coupling that 
machine learning AI based system, coupling it and or with rules based classification so that you can govern and control the machine learning in a uh, in an authoritative manner. Because we well, everyone talks about machine learning, but let's not forget every learner, every student, be it a machine or a person, needs a professor to mark the papers. And rules, if you like, are a good way of explaining you know, the, the marking of the papers so that the ML works to a point that it can be trusted by the business, which is quite important uh, when to get the technology adopted. Can the software integrate well with all those system applications and information services? Can you knowledge your business model, not by a maths grad doing uh, data science, but can the business user who understands the business domain do that knowledge modeling without intermediating themselves uh, through a, a maths grad who doesn't understand the business? So the very important uh, point. So that's what should go into the stack. And then often I get asked about, well, they, you know, Jeremy, what is, you know, data and text, what is it? Well, text, of course, is how humans communicate. I'm actually, although I'm speaking, uh, I'm using language. Uh, that language can be turned into text. And in business, contracts, reports, all of that is usually arise, firstly, the, 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 the root data document is a piece of text. Social media threads, chatbot conversations, call center logs, catalogs, design criteria, you know, customer onboarding documents, product sheets, uh, records, and it doesn't stop there because everyone says, well, actually, is it just unstructured stuff that we put in our content management system? Well, no, it's not because it could be the names of the schema names in databases, the special instructions sitting in the databases to do with a payment, the metadata values that are used to join different things together. And of course, text also arrives in many forms. Tweets, emails, news, PDFs, documents, presentations, loads and loads of different ways that this amazing information asset arrives, but we have to, if we're gonna process it machine to machine, or process it better, uh, you know, uh, human to machine or human to human, we have to be able to turn that text back into qualified data. So then the next question is, well, how much data is in text? So I, in this example, I'm going to take one sentence. This happens to be uh, remove. This happens to be one sentence out of a uh, a medical report. And this is what it says. This is a simple harmoni uh, harmonization, enrichment, and extraction example. Uh, here's the one sentence. Initial information received from the reporter on August the 14th, 2014. This is a report of a serious adverse event from a reporter regarding a 73-year-old white female subject experiencing a five-minute blackout on August the 10th while taking full night for the treatment of insomnia and nasal for the treatment of migraines. Easy. It's raw text. We can read it. But can we? Because firstly, we need the data. Well, picking out the 73 and putting it against the patient's age to make it qualified, that's pretty simple. The agenda of is pretty easy because we can look for the word female or whatever uh, and put that in. But actually, in this case, we've now had to harmonize uh, the uh, ethnicity. And we've seen that in the report it's saying white female, but actually in the data world, we want to say it needs to harmonize up to the preferred term, which is Caucasian. We've seen that the treatment, we've spotted two treatments here. One is that full night is for the treatment of insomnia. And actually, we don't want, we know that that's a brand. How do we know that? Because semantically we've, we've resolved to that brand. But we don't, because we're trying to pass it on to a, uh, a generic uh, report, we need to change the full night into its own generic name, which is escloclone. And actually, for good measure, not mentioned in the report at all, but actually through linked data, we want to go off and get the DB code for that drug so that that helps with the analysis and the business intelligence downstream. So we've now harmonized uh, drug names into generics. We've picked up the DB code. We've analyzed that it actually was being taken for insomnia from the text. 
We've then moved on to the next one, Zolpidine, sorry, uh, Nathan, which happens to be Zolpidin. We've picked up that database, we've picked up that treatment. And then because it's uh, an important medical report that we're working with, actually we're dealing with semantic breaks. Here it says a five minute blackout. Actually, the medical term for five minute blackout is syncope. And so by putting that semantic semantic AI, the, through the semantic integration service, Semaphore or the semantic AI engine is doing harmonizing enrichment and extraction. Also, if you, I don't know if you're looking carefully, but that August the 14th, 2014 was a full date at the top, but the blackout occurred on August the 10th. Because we know it's August the 14th, 2014, we can semantically infer that it's August the 10th, 2014, and add that date in. So now we're enriching existing dates to make them standard so that then the downstream systems and the BSS intelligence systems and the other things can, can do work with it and it's not dealing with dirty data. So taking that flow uh, of text into qualified data, what do you get out? Well, if you think about what the sort of systems are that are text dependent, search engines, contract management, risk reporting, process automation, metadata management, compliance, processing, predictive analytics, you can read the list. What, when you put semantic AI, add that value, do you get? And the value is that the qualified data turns your search engine into a perceptive insight engine. It tightens up your contract lifecycle management because there may be clauses in your contracts which previously were being coded by humans into your contract lifecycle management, which you couldn't, couldn't afford to capture, so you're missing out and you want to tighten up your contractual rights with your suppliers or with your customers or whatever. Our process automation becomes uh, enriched robotic process automation end-to-end, -end, not one step at a time, but because we're providing context, we can move it along. And you can see all these different examples. Um, and the, that movement using semantic AI to create qualified data leads to valuable business outcomes, uh, basically competitive advantage and 1010 projects. And the sorts of projects that we, you know, frequently get involved in is uh, just to do with boosting customer intimacy, revenue loss prevention, you know, end-to-end -end robotic process automation, silo agnostic business intelligence. So you've got unified data around the business, unified intelligence of the business, you know, risk optimization, not risk reporting. Uh, risk optimization is about risk assessment in line, not after the event when you're just reporting what risk you've got, it's deciding whether you want to take the risk. Safety analytics, heavy asset servicing, all that list. So simplistically, you go from very text dependent systems, you add this new layer of uh, semantic AI, in our world it's semaphore, into the mix, you t gives you a massive advantage because your data is of high quality, the data is both great and we've made great data, and your business outcomes are, are very measurable um, and they done at 10% of the time and 10% of the cost. And in summary, my part, really before uh, Scott moves into the technology that is used to do that and some examples, um, it, I talked about that interplay between humans and machines and we're very strong at smart logic that humans create and manage knowledge models. And it's the non and it's business users that capture the business rules, the meanings and the relationships. We can augment that process with machine learning and we do and it's you know and it makes it faster. But the curation and the moderation and the control of that those knowledge models is ultimately done by a subject matter expert. And not ultimately because he's into disintermediated, it is done by the subject matter expert, uh, because the software is easy to use. That the system can then take the context, which is the knowledge model, and encode that using the engine into the form of metadata. And I put metadata here in brackets because it's to, it, it, people get a bit hung up about is it data or is it metadata. Actually, if you're creating, synthesizing good, great data, it's data. If you're making high quality data, it could be metadata or data. And I think 
grow gradually that idea of meta and data will grow will, will go away and it'll just be seen as great data once that's happened we're you adopting the enterprise semantic ai platform means that context is addressed by by all your enterprise systems so gone is the spaghetti in the meetings and the end the year to you know to skin up a new system with all that money because a change in the context is immediately addressable by all those enterprise systems at the same time, provided they're integrated with it, so you have to be good at integrating. And that this synthesized contextual data is harmonized, enriched, and of good quality, which is often not the case when you look at your existing uh, you know, extract, transform, and load uh, flows. We know that the, the end data is a poor representation, sort of, uh, uh, lowest common denominator of data because we haven't harmonized it. We've had to transform it to get it from one system to another. And with semantics, you don't need to transform. You harmonize, uh, you enrich, and you add the quality standard. And that then gives you the idea of a 1010 project because it can be done really quickly uh, with at, at much higher quality and with much less cost. So that's compared to the old way of working. Uh, the old way of working is the one we've worked with for the last 50 years, and semantics is the next way of working, uh, but already being adopted by some of the world's largest organizations to actually get themselves a competitive advantage uh, before everybody else does. Thank you, and I'll turn over to Scott. Okay, so let's see. Can we hear and see? We can. Great. Okay, so I'm going to take uh, what Jeremy has said before and augment it a little bit by talking about some specific tools um, and techniques that we use. Um, so one of the things that, that Jeremy talked about and I'm going to emphasize throughout is the the concept of a model driven semantic AI. Um, so now we're trying to define semantic information from structured and unstructured text and providing a, a metadata layer, if you will, that helps describe semantically what your data is about. Um, small terminology check. What do we mean by model? Well, it can mean a lot of things. In our purposes, we're talking about ontologies and taxonomies. It could be a control vocabulary of any kind, a list or anything, but it really needs to have some sort of a formal structure to it. And the formal structure that we use for this is the W3C Semantics Technologies, um, which is a, a set of recommendations. And, and I'll talk about these in a little bit um, all the different technologies that we're actually using. Um, and I just wanted to say, this is a particular way of modeling and we're gonna use this modeling to drive how we actually extract information from text. Um, and we're gonna use it to create rules about how we uh, extract information from text and how we enrich that text, et cetera, and, and enhance search. Uh, are other models possible? Yes, but this is what we're going to talk about today. We're just going to fixate on, on these particular technologies. Uh, the, the key part of what we want to do here is to enrich, extract, and harmonize data. Um, and what I'm going to focus on today is amongst the enrichment, extraction, and harmonizing, I'll mostly talk about extracting uh, information. So we'll, I'll, I'll focus on information extraction and how we do this in a model-driven way. But the same could also be said for, you know, enriching information assets with more complete information. In fact, we'll see some examples of that as we go along. And harmonizing, I'll get to that a little bit here, but not, not much in detail. All of those are probably other topics that we could spend another uh, seminar on. Uh, so the the pieces that we're going to use uh, to achieve this is to start with building and managing semantic models. I'll have a little bit to say about how about tools to actually help you build an ontology and how you probably already have the, the beginnings of, of what you need to build an ontology. Um, and then uh, 
extract, enrich, harmonize, and apply that to the, uh, the business problem. In this case, I have a screen image of just a, a faceted search, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But in a number of ways, we can, now that we have enriched that information, created metadata about it, we have better ways to search that information, we have uh, better ways to describe that information. The technologies, W3C semantic technologies, I'm gonna throw, for those of you not familiar with this, this is uh, going to be a lot of words thrown at you. Uh, for those who are familiar with it, it will be boring. Uh, because these are really the, some of the um, better known standards that are used through W3C. Um, the tool that we'll focus on most is a simple knowledge organization system. This is a an ontology approach in which um, terms are actually described as concepts and these concepts can have uh, relationships to other concepts and those concepts can have uh, different labels. Those labels can be preferred or uh, alternative. So it's a great way of describing terms and relationships between terms that can help you drive how you're gonna extract text and get information out of your data. Um, we'll talk also about how we can um, have a, a two-dimensional view of, of that model, uh, one that is terminology-based, SCOS, et cetera, also with uh, OWL-based um, definitions. Um, and then uh, the new uh, kid in town, Shackle, the, the RDF shapes constraint language, and, and it is what it says we're taking RDF, which is a set of triples and saying, how do we want to shape those things? And then use that to say, this is how we're gonna validate our data. We're gonna say, if it isn't in this shape, then we have a validation uh, problem. And we'll show some examples of that. Diving into this a little bit more, um, first of all, all the things that we've talked about so far, the underlying technology is RDF, or RDF triples. Uh, graph data, well, a particular kind of graph databases, which are the RDF graph databases. Um, and as a key example here, um, I have just a particular term I, I picked out, internet. And you'll notice that what I've done here is to put internet in this uh, these brackets to say this thing is an object, it, it's, it's a thing. Um, and it has a preferred label, internet. Uh, that's the display label you see. It also has, also has an alternative label, World Wide Web. Um, it has a hierarchical relationship, which means that there is a broader, more general term, networking. And networking also has a broader term, concept, information and communication technology. Uh, there are also associative relationships. Uh, for example, internet has a related concept of websites, which is slightly different than internet, but related. Uh, and then the last part, getting into an RDFS OWL, internet can be a member of information technology. So now we can do whatever RDFS OWL reasoning we want to on, on that sort of thing, or just know that we have a particular type of classification of set membership. All of that is just kind of an example of the really the key parts that we're, we're using in this technology to actually uh, drive and create uh, terms in a rich uh, context so that we can start extracting information uh, from text. And here's a graphical view of this. This is something that the people often um, gravitate toward, especially in early stages. We have internet in the middle here. Uh, it has a couple of broader terms, including the networking we pointed out, and has some related terms, including the websites that we pointed out, and some alternative labels. So those are the core technologies that we'll be using. Uh, and then this is a way of looking at one of those objects. So um, in a little more detail. So in this case, that object, as opposed to internet in the previous slide, this is gonna be Apollo 11. And we'll get into text extraction with this in a, in a little bit here. Um, so first of all, we have represented a concept hierarchy. This can be as deep as you want to. We also have um, uh, the ability to create different um, concept schemes. So people, places, program missions are the highest level view of this data. And those concept schemes will be a key part of 
how we actually, or one of the ways that we can use faceted, uh, automatically create faceted views. Um, and then we have some property values. Uh, we can see that there are some preferred labels. There are some alternative labels. Those preferred la labels can have different languages. Um, and uh, we have uh, the hierarchical, again, the broader concepts. We also have associative relationships uh, that, for example, Apollo 11 was crewed by uh, some people, has spacecraft associated with, etc. So all of these are really descriptive terms that are saying these are some things that Apollo 11 is about. Um, we also have cross-sectional. Everything I've shown before this was really SCOS modeling. Uh, in addition to that, as kind of a different way, a, another way of looking at all this data, um, Apollo 11 is a member of the class mission, and we can have a rich ontology sitting behind this. And it's kind of two different ways of modeling that same data, and they're completely interoperable. Um, uh, constraint validation warnings. One of the things we did here is we added a, a Japanese tag for Apollo 11. And in this case, we have uh, written a shackle rule in the, in the background that says, well, uh, Japanese is not available for classification. So we we actually do uh, have language packs in a number of languages, including Japanese. But if your system does not include Japanese, we might want to put a warning out to say that, well, you, you, just to know you can't classify uh, in Japanese. Um, this is a warning. You can also have, a, have a, just an in, informative uh, warning in Shackle and also a, a, a clear violation. Um, so that is, again, that's, that's kind of your data uh, validation piece of this. So you've, you've built all of your data. You can create rules in the background that says, here's how this data should look, and here are some things we may wanna, might want people to know about. These are all you know, available through uh, fairly easy um, pieces of code, if you will, for that. It's all really model-based. It's all really RDF-based. Again, uh, there is um, a visualization of this, and I wanted to point out that there are two dimensions to this visual space. The first is our our taxonomic definitions. Apollo 11 is has broader uh, ha, um, what has broader is really the taxonomic part uh, than more of the ontological relationships such as crewed by, has spacecraft launched by and launched from. Uh, alternative labels, that's more of the taxonomic definitions. But the other uh, dimension that we're showing here is each of these are color coded for the different classes that are being used. So Buzz, Michael, and Neil are all um, astronaut, that's the class that they belong to, Apollo 11 uh, uh, belongs to mission, et cetera. Um, so now let's start, get, start getting in. Given that we have that model, we have information about Apollo 11, uh, and we can now start saying, okay, how are we going to utilize that model to be able to take text and start to uh, extract data from it, um, extract metadata, if you will. So what what we're going to, the, the way that we're going to approach this is to use some NLP-based um, rules, and what we actually have is about 50 different types of rule templates. Uh, those rule templates are applied to the terms that we define and creates a rule set. And we could have actually uh, more than one rule set that we define and apply to documents. Um, so the it's built to be used by business users. There's not any programming uh, associated with this. That uh, for in this particular case, it is a matter of setting up your model, uh, setting up a little bit of, of a background that that uh, may have involve some XML uh, knowledge that I'm not going to get into. Uh, and then you can run this against any document. Uh, given your model, and if you change the model, then the results you're going to get out of this is, are, are going to be a little bit div uh, different. And that way, it's really the model that's driving this and not a lot of the um, the actual programming that goes behind it. 
Uh, it is scoring based. You'll notice that there are scores uh, for each of the um, entities. Well, first of all, I should state that what has happened here is we have extracted a number of entities from this document, and I'll, this will be clear in the next slide actually, um, and we can score uh, how well those actually fit uh, the model that we have created. Um, and like I said, over 50 rule templates, uh, we can uh, generate, and each of those generated for each concept um, out of the template. And we can see, and I'll show in the next slide, that you can start being able to see how the decision was made. And that's really good for when you need to, to explain how you actually got your classification results. This is not a training-based uh, approach to building this data. It is based on these rules and based on, as it, and I'll talk about in more detail, uh, looking at some ways to create uh, NLP rules. Um, I think uh, Jeremy's mentioned that we have 20 plus rules, including Chinese, uh, Japanese, Korean. If you're a GM, it turns out Korean is very important. Uh, so here's here's that same view. This might be bringing a little more detail into it. I'll go it fairly quickly. This is the text that we are be analyzing. That text can come in the forms of PDFs, Word documents, etc. Um, and we have chosen in this case Apollo 11. You can see that that has been chosen here. Uh, and again, that metadata has been created by Semaphore. These are all the terms in that model that we have been able to extract from this document with weights for, uh, for all of them. Notice that Apollo 11 turns out to be very quite highly rated for this document, 0.98. Although, can you see Apollo 11 in here? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, I wanted to point out, out also that remember we talked about the concept schemes earlier. That's kind of what's going on here. We have defined that there are these four concept schemes and that really defines, and each one of those has entities inside of them, concepts uh, defined for each of those. And that color coding explains why there's a, a color coding here on this part. Um, the transparency of the rules uh, is that we can show the evidence for why Apollo 11 has been chosen. In this uh, case, we don't have any preferred term. Um, we don't even have any um, alternative terms. Uh, Apollo 11 just doesn't show up here, and none, none of its uh, alternative terms do either. But there are a number of other pieces that are evidence. For example, this COSPAR um, ID is unique to um, the Saturn V rocket, uh, which was used for Apollo 11. Uh, Michael Collins, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Armstrong are all related to Apollo 11. All of these. Uh, put together uh, allowed the engine to conclude that Apollo 11 is relevant by a 0.98, uh, not because Apollo 11 appears in here, but because we did all the processing and we created all the rules and we created the model that allowed us to come to this conclusion. So that's what this bottom line is all about here, is that we're, we're understanding the text. We're, we're getting a, a little closer to really understanding the text by being able to say, okay, we have actual terms in here that we can match, but we also have these relationships um, and, and a model that says, here's how we can start interpreting some of this data and guiding that, and given that guidance, we can come to co uh, conclusions. Um, now the output of this, this is just a, a mock-up here in this particular case. Notice that we have uh, those uh, schemes again. Um, and um, facilities, labs, organizations, programs, et cetera. We can use these to start creating uh, facets right out of the box. Uh, I, also, we can use these uh, term relationships to say that there are um, these relationships that you can look at relative to, in this case, it's Apollo 16. We can start looking at people, for example. Um, 
then there's overviews that the results are more accurate because we're able to bring this information together, et cetera. So this is just an example of once you're able to extract that metadata, this is what the sort of accurate UI you could start creating to do search and browsing and things like that. Um, as I said, I'm not going to talk a lot about harmonization. The uh, the key things I want to do is to talk about the different well, uh, pieces you can do, reference data sourcing, you can do linked data. We have a number of ways of bringing in spreadsheets, and, uh, uh, relational data um, ex through spreadsheets, etc. Um, and we're going to focus a little bit in a couple of slides here on this idea of assisted model generation. So uh, one of the, like I said, one of the questions is people will ask, how do I get these models? Well, answer number one is that all organizations have these to some degree. They're in spreadsheets, um, they're, they're in tables, they're, they're in you know various unstructured formats. And putting them into these formats is one of the things that um, it's actually not that difficult, and that's one of the, um, I think, key um, differentiators for RDF, uh, SCOS, et cetera, is that the complexity of it being able to put it into that data, and I think Jeremy touched on some of this earlier, is actually quite low, that sort of threshold. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this uh, other than to say that this is the normal flow that we have. So I talked about this idea of where do ontologies come from. Uh, and I'll show an example here in a minute that we can actually use that classification that I showed earlier on documents to give you some information on, oh, maybe this should be in the ontology. Uh, we then use the rules, a uh, publisher, to, to use the ontology and rules to create a set of rules for the semantic enhancement ser server, which basically is going to give us index that'll go to solar, elastic, and things like that for for search. Uh, and also the, uh, the classification server, which is going to start bringing in content and pushing out metadata for that, that content uh, so that and that's going to help you with search and, and browsing and, and, and other things. I mentioned earlier that um, this assistive model generation uh, aspect, uh, which is to say that we, uh, ontologies, you may have some information uh, in, your, uh, in your organization. Uh, and you need to organize some of that, but you know how, how are we actually going to do this? Are we going to automatically generate a, a model? Well, that you'll get various results with that. The focus we have is assisted model generation. So we can generate some models, we can curate them, et cetera. In this case, what I've done is I've run that same classification server engine we saw earlier on a document, and I've pulled out that sea of tranquility is one of the concepts I found in here that might actually be a good um, piece to add into my ontology. Uh, as a place of interest, POI. So this is just a tool to help you start building that ontology from the sort of documents that you have, analyze those, extract some entities. Now you can start creating some ontologies. Now, the overall build that I, I, I have here is that what we want to do is to to use this modeling, to use this classification server, to take documents, create the metadata so that we can do the type of data analytics that, that everybody needs in their organization. And that's what this is saying uh, through structured or textual and that um, right now, you know, over 80% of this uh, information or, or these techniques can get up to 80% or thereabouts. I'm gonna show a bit of an example here. Again, what we're doing is to say that we have some text that is in unstructured format. And what we really need to do is have it into that structured format so we can do analytics, et cetera. Uh, and we'll build some rules in order to, uh, uh, to do this. Uh, these rules will start with the ontology. So here are some ontology terms that we can extract from this data. 
uh, we have some entities that we can extract from them automatically. We can find dates in various formats. You know, so there's multiple formats in here. Um, and then we can run some natural language processing to do noun phrase analysis and things like that. Um, and take this information and put it into a common uh, format, you know, common date format even, um, uh, common uh, predicate names, et cetera. Um, uh, another example, same sort of thing. Here we have a PDF document um, and we have the entities that we're able to extract from it, including that this, uh, the dollar amount here is, has been turned into an integer so that we can work with it on that, um, on that level. Uh, we've, we can grab other information from this. We, we found Michigan in here. We found this Barry Steel. Uh, and the Barry Steel, the names and things like that, is just one of the types of entities that we can automatically uh, get out of there. We don't have to know about Barry Steel exactly. Uh, we can, one of the entities that we extract is um, people names. Building onto that previous one, we can grab this. Um, the variations of, for example, price. Uh, and you see that it has been stated here in a, a number of different ways, including approximately and et cetera. And so this is, that's great. You, you can look at this and say, okay, that, that's fine. And, you know, a lot of things can do that. But the question is, when we have 1.2, uh, well, 12, uh, 12 point, I guess it's a trillion dollars in this case, um, how do we know that's a market value? Well, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to start looking at the context in which that number appeared. Um, and we'll use anchors for these. And these anchors will uh, look for key terms. Uh, and those key terms will not just be the terms that we find in here, but also notice the common stock versus common equity have been uh, found in here. That means, and those are synonymic, uh, part of the model again. Uh, I'm going to go quickly through this one because I think it pretty much says the same thing we did before. The key thing here is that we have been able to extract some information about a person and getting uh, some uh, information about them and we're tying it to this ontology. For example, if we know that uh, someone is a chief executive officer, we also know that they're uh, part of, they have a, a they have a board role and that, that's a title. Uh, so this relationship can give us more information than just chief executive officer, et cetera. Go quickly through this one too. One of the things we've done is to extract names and titles from, from this document and we turn those into a fact, that fact being Lawrence Ellison has title, chief executive officer and director and, and we can do that for the rest. Um, this gets into a bit of a, a interesting build. So I, one, again, this is all about how we're going about extracting these, uh, these facts by looking at the, the area of the, um, the anchors and, um, around something. So in this case, we're looking for information about premium and we're actually looking for this this first layer. So this kind of gives us a description here. It's probably going to take me longer to describe this than I really have time for, but it's looking at how do we look at evidence in different layers for this? So we were actually saying we look for evidence of a premium anchor. We skip up the 50 words. We look for evidence of a layer one, and then we can skip up to 25 words and then look for a deposit premium fact. That deposit premium fact, it, it then has a sequence of its own. So we can start using this to say, well, we we found a particular denominated amount of fact. Uh, and we looked, and we know that because we have a currency fact and a number of facts. So notice how these are kind of building on each other in this in this uh, diagram here. Um, these should have been different colors. That's interesting. Um, deposit premium then is this big fact in here that has been 
uh, captured because we were able to do the underlying pieces of that. And then in that uh, part, we're also finding, finding deposit premium. So this is the sort of thing that we're doing. And the one part that's not uh, showing up here as much is that we may have um, other words or uh, broader terms or some sort of relationship for deposit premium or something for GDP, et cetera. And we'll still find those because one of the things we're doing is we're combining, we're creating the rules from the templates that allow us to apply those to all those terms. So we can use um, G GBP and some other term just as easily. And then we're looking for evidence of a premium. So benefits of semantic AI, um, process faster with greater accuracy, actionable information that gets into the um, support for um, analytics and for search, et cetera, extend solutions to cover new different document types. We showed some document types here, uh, extending that is, is a matter of doing uh, uh, some work um, in, in techniques, but the, the rule-based uh, approach is general enough to do a very wide range of it. In fact, our training uses uh, cooking recipes, which is another good domain. Uh, results are fully auditable and traceable, and that, that's a very important piece here as opposed to uh, with machine learning, your results may vary depending on how good your uh, your training has been and the closeness of your documents to the training, and it may change uh, depending on the learning algorithm. Can you really audit and trace how you've arrived at a decision? In this case, we have very clear ways and have built into our tool sets clear ways to actually uh, have that auditability and traceability. Uh, and hence, your compliance burden is going to be quicker to get to than other approaches. I think that's going to do it for me. And uh, I'll, I'll, br I'll yeah. <clears throat> bring in Jeremy. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining our webinar. Um, if you are looking at semantics, uh, thinking about text analytics, trying to get uh, make great data out of your text, wherever it is, be it in your databases or content systems or search engines or insight engines or contract systems or wherever, um, best place to go probably is uh, the Gartner Peer Insights uh, for get some references on smart logic. These are independent customer reviews of what it's like to engage with smart logic, what it's like to look at Semaphore. And then as a couple of credentializers, we're a leader in the Gartner 2018 Magic Quadrant for Metadata Management. Uh, and you'll see there that they emphasize our uniqueness of uh, metadata, <laughs> semantic metadata management. Um, but that leaves us with uh, not a lot of time for questions, but if nope. you have, some, we have a, we have a oh. number of questions, and now I'm going to try to pick out. There's we have a lot of great questions. Um, here's one thing. Um, the one question is: Can the rules be customized for any your own particular use case, business use case? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, as I said toward the end, uh, there another set of examples we have. Um, comes through our training, which is for um, uh, for cooking recipes, which is a very different domain than some of the business types of domains that we were looking at earlier. But yes, it can be customized to any any type of uh, business use case. I think I think what possibly didn't come out so well is how much of this is automatic. So building building the knowledge model is assisted uses machine is assisted machine learning to help you get that right but there's a line that the, you have to have a human curator so that's <coughs> assisted once the model is built everything else that you've seen today is automatic so the rule building is done by uh, if you like these rule templates which if you like are a strategy one written once for a specific use case, and we've got we've covered a lot of them in 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 the life. So it's not about can you you know you might have a strategy for news, news being usually about a single subject, certain art you know quite short, 
and so we've got that. Uh, if you're dealing with uh, investment reports, you know, we've got a already pre-written strategies for uh, how to get the data out of an investment report. If you're doing customer onboarding, it's a slightly different strategy. But the generation of the rules is automatic. The extraction of the data is automatic. The, the machine is doing everything governed by the model, which is part assisted, but which is moderated by humans to make sure that the quality is high. Yeah, and I, I just want to emphasize what Jeremy is saying here is that even before you look at the rules, all you need to do is create a model for your domain, and already you've got a customization. And it looks like we're out of time. So um, as Jeremy said, we'll get some answers to these questions and send them out to participants. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And um, have a good day. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye.